Welcome to ATC. Today we are going to discuss about a 50 year old female who was brought to ER with a history of alleged uh, history of uh, deliberate self harm. So she was initially taken to another hospital, uh, given some primary treatment and then referred to a hospital. So basically a 50 year old female was found at home uh, with multiple bits of vomiting and followed that she was actually drowsy. So she was taken to another hospital and when they found in the near, near to her, they found two bottles of pesticides. Uh, actually one is on something known as Ecalex and one Phenvalerate. Fen uh, Basically it's a parathroid uh, based compound. So they took this bottle to the Nihabe <coughs> hospital and they are actually, uh, after, she was immediately taken to the hospital. So within about one hour she was taken. So they gave her gastric lavage and uh, yeah. considering the uh, uh, this thing uh, drug in the uh, pesticide. So we don't know when she has consumed this. No. So they have found her lying unresponsive. Yeah. And meanwhile they found few bottles of pesticides Pesticide. mean, besides her, mm. and they have taken to the local hospital mm. after the incident almost one hour. One That's hour, what we one know. hour. But we don't know when she has consumed. Yeah. That is very important because mm. consumption and gastric level are going to be, uh, mm. that is a time frame that we will mm. say that whether there is going to be any use for doing gastric mm. lavage. So, uh, after uh, so one the hour. So, the bystander found her, they took her to the hospital. From that one hour, they have taken to the hospital. Mm. Okay. So, by the time she reached her, she was actually drowsy, but mm -hmm. uh, they gave her a, uh, this thing. Uh, when she came, uh, she was uh, somewhat okay, so they gave her a like, gastric lavage. So, you think it is advisable to give gastric lavage for a patient who is drowsy mm -hmm. with the whatever sensorium that you are telling? Mm -hmm. uh, no, actually, it's, actually it's a contraindication, uh, but... Yes, secure the airway first, mm -hmm. then go ahead with the uh, gastric mm -hmm. lavage water. Mm -hmm. The thing benefit, you should not be risking the patient also. So, mm. here whatever benefit that she is going to get, mm. secure the airway first, then go ahead with the gastric lavage. Mm. So, whatever benefit is there or not, mm. but you should not cause harm to the patient by risking the airway. Mm. So, that is the first thing that we have to do. Mm. Then. So basically, when she arrived at the hospital, actually, uh, this thing, uh, she was drowsy and also on the examination, she was found to have desaturation. And also, she was not being... Uh, Coming to our hospital. Uh, la, la, there itself. Their hospital. After lavage. Ah, after lavage. But same time, <coughs> she was hematonically stable, but then we intubated the patient, secured the airway. Mm. And actually, considering the uh, drug to be a pyrethroid compound, they considered it to be an OP poisoning. They started her on atropin. Okay. So at that time on examination, she was found to have like <coughs> a significant amount of crepitations and everything as noted by the... Now coming to the decontamination, but they have only done a GI decontamination, which is not sufficient enough for an organophosphorus compound. Hmm. So what is the uh, major uh, thing that you need to do is the surface decontamination, surface decontamination. Mm -hmm. which is very important. You have to do a thorough body wash, whether mm -hmm. it was done for this patient or not. Uh, basically, they removed every clothing and actually she was wearing okay. and actually, but then they were primarily focusing on securing the airway and other management. Okay. So the, again, uh, that is one of the key thing. Whenever mm -hmm. there is a womb test that is containing in the dust particle or even in the body, they can get still get absorbed and the patient can go into mm -hmm. further worsening of the symptom. Mm -hmm. Also, the people who are handling the patient. Mm -hmm for going and touching the patient, they also is a high risk of getting the mm. features of OP poisoning. Mm. So, that is the most important decontamination. Whenever we say of decontamination, it is removal of the poison. There mm. are different ways of decontamination. One is GI decontamination, mm. one is enhanced elimination, mm. then another one is via dialysis, you can eliminate the poison. Mm. But surface decontamination is the most important thing that you need to remember in organ of phosphorus poisoning. Mm. So, we are not very sure whether it has been done that or not from yeah. the outside mm. hospital. Fine. So, from the history we got, her airway was secured, her dress uh, clothing was removed and... I'll go this way. She uh, was taken to the hospital. They did a gastric lavage. Mm. He, she desaturated, mm. then intubated, mm. then they removed the dress, started mm. on atropin and referred here. Yeah. So, ideally the sequence should have been securing the airway, mm. going ahead with the gastric lavage, surface decontamination, mm. then starting on atropin and uh, there is, they have done everything but mm. it's not in the order that order. is supposed to be. Mm. So, from the <coughs> summary we got, actually, she, they, she, was, uh, she was given up to 64 mg of atropine. Okay. And they started her around 6 mg per hour infusion. Okay. So, uh, how uh, does they come to this conclusion that they have to give 64 mg of atropine? So, basically, uh, they haven't mentioned anything, but <coughs> what we, we usually do is actually we start around like about uh, 1.2 to 3 mg and then we re uh, repeat every 5 minutes, like mm -hmm. double the dose until we see clinical improvement. There is one is actually, there is a reduction of secretions in the chest. There is chest becomes more clear. If she's having initial bradycardia, that improves after time. And also uh, this thing, uh, if pupils are actually too contracted, it will start dilating. Okay. So multiple clinical parameters we consider, <coughs> consider together to assume that she's adequately atropinized. Okay. So, so uh, the most important clinical feature, <coughs> what you said is correct. You mm. have to look for the bronchorea. Mm. How is the secretions? You auscultate and see. Mm. How is the secretions are? If the secretions are <coughs> dried up, mm. that is fine. Heart rate, we are not concerned at this point of mm. time. 
pupillary size we are not concerned at this point of time but mm. later on yes we have to be very specific persistent tachycardia they can cause further complication mm. so uh, we have to be very specific usually what happens what will be the clinical presentation they will be ideally they can have bradycardia mm. and so on top of this bradycardia when you give the atropine the heart rate increases so mm. maybe somewhere around 110 120 it will be maintained mm. when the patient is on atropine that mm. depends upon the severity of toxicity mm. also so, uh, can we get uh, normal heart rate in uh, atropine poisoning? Yeah, because actually uh, secondary to bronchospasm and this bronchorea patient struggle can again increase the heart rate. Okay. So, it can counteract the bradycardia effect. Nicotinic yes. There is a few group of patients where nicotinic receptors is also getting affected. Hmm. So, as a result also there can be a normal heart rate. Hmm. There need to be tachycardia but hmm. due to the balance of the hmm. brady and tachy it will be a normal hmm. heart rate hmm. and another important thing is that majority of the time they consume along with alcohol hmm. so alcohol it's basically it causes cns depression but hmm. it usually it increases the heart rate hmm. so uh, if they have consumed along with the alcohol hmm. a heart rate might be normal or maybe you can even find tachycardia hmm. so uh, just going ahead with bradycardia we will not be able to see hmm. so heart rate is not the primary uh, end point of one we say at atropinization hmm. we have to look in for the secretion so, mm -hmm. they have gone for 64 mg. How long she was there in the ED? Any idea? In that hospital? About uh, 3 to 4 hours maximum. 3 to 4 hours. 3 mm -hmm. to 4 hours, you just think of doubling dose of atropine, 64 mg. Uh, just imagine, they, they would not have waited for that 5 or 10 minutes for the effect of the atropine. Mm -hmm. So, usually when you see that, uh, whatever be that 64 mg doses, they need at least 2 hours. Mm -hmm. So, 3 hours, whether they have really looked into or they were just jumping and giving atropine, we are not very sure. Mm -hmm. So, we cannot say how much atropine is needed, hmm. but usually when you go into the evidences, the literature, what are the initial maybe very high doses, hmm. maybe 60, 100 and all, it's a maximum dose of atropine that was initially required. But hmm. you cannot predict that. That all depends upon the amount of consumption of poisoning. Hmm. Suppose the patient who has taken just 10 ml and the other one has taken 100 ml, so the effect will is going to be totally different. Hmm. So the dose of atropine required, we cannot predict. Hmm. And again, sending a serenostyle, colonial stress level also will not will not just give you a severity. Hmm. You know that, okay, there is an organ of poisoning, but with this, to say severity, sometime it will be difficult because the reports can be contradictory also sometimes. Mm. So, uh, you have to see clinically. That is the only other option. Mm. But you have to keep in your mind that you cannot sustain a high dose of atropine for a long time also. Mm. Uh, you need to have a continuous maintenance of atropine. But high doses of, again, high dose of atropine can cause further uh, issues mm. with atropine psychosis and atropine related <coughs> persistent tachycardia. And all. Mm. Fine. <coughs> so, how will you decide the <coughs> infusion rate? They have decided that 6 mg is what she is required. Hmm. How they decided that? Basically, uh, the total amount that was required for atomization from the 10 to 20 percent of that amount. So, so that is what 64 mg, they hmm. took it as 6 mg hmm. and started on an infusion hmm. and they referred her here. Hmm. They did start pralidoxine? No, no, not from there. Not, they didn't start pralidoxine. Hmm. Okay. So, pralidoxime was not started. They intubated the patient. They started atropin. Mm -hmm. 64 mg total bolus was given as per their uh, records and 6 mg per hour infusion and mm -hmm. she has been referred here for mm -hmm. further management. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> so, on, our, on arrival in our ED, she was intubated and she was completely unconscious. And so, we checked the airway. Airway ET was secured at uh, 7.5 size tube was secured at 21 centimeters and breathing, she had equal air entry. There was no crepes knotted. Uh, saturation was 100% uh, uh, in room air and uh, not in, in this thing. Ventilator, on ventilator. On ventilator. Uh, blood pressure was uh, 120 by 80 and heart rate was 108. And GCS was E1, BT and M1 and pupils at that point was 2.5 mm and equally reactive. Uh, she was not uh, found to be febrile and her GR base was 239. Okay. Uh, so, we took an ABG also. It was for showing a pH of 7.22 with a PCO2 of 40 and a bicarb of 16. PCO2 of? 40. 40, okay. Mm. And bicarbonate of? 16. 16. 16. Uh. Okay. So, <coughs> and PO2 is also normal. So what is the reason for acidosis here then? 16 mm. bicarbonate, what is the expected PCO2? Uh, 16 will be like, uh, 20, 24, 24, 24 plus 8, 24, 8, 8 is uh, 32, 32 plus 32. or minus 2. Mm. So 34, 34. There is amount of metabolic acidosis and respiratory acidosis. Mm. Maybe respiratory acidosis can be secondary to the secretions and all. Mm. But why metabolic acidosis she is having? Uh, we don't have any history of any co-ingestion, but maybe we could have been. But, mm. no, no. Before mm. co-ingestion, what else we can think of? Why she is having metabolic acidosis? Renal parameters. Mm. What are the renal parameters? Uh, creatinine is uh, 3.9. 
थ्री पॉइंट नाइन रीजन फॉर ए के हियर ओके आई डोंट नो वेदर इट वाज एन ए के और एन अक्यूट ऑन क्रॉनिक सो व्हाट कुड बी द रीजन फॉर अ रीनल फेलियर दैट पॉइंट वी डिड हैव एन हिस्ट्री लाइक मेडिकल हिस्ट्री ऑफ प्रीवियस डिहाइड्रेशन कुड हैव बीन लाइक फ्री रीनल ओके सो वी वोमिटिंग एट होम आल्सो एंड देन सो आई वांट टू नो देन यूरिया वैल्यू यूरिया इज 26 26 सो प्री रीनल इज आउट so it's not more of free renal it is mm. more of an acute kidney injury renal mm. issue mm. primarily what we are dealing with mm. so what could be the reasons here what is the lactate level lactate is uh, this thing 3.5 higher on the higher side mm. uh, sugars sugars was uh, 329 329 ketones uh, ketones negative negative so mm. primarily the main three things we have ruled out we have lactic acidosis maybe yes borderline mm. then renal failure it is there mm. and uh, there is uh, sugars are on the higher side but there is no evidence of mm. ketosis so mm. ketones are negative mm. so the reason for renal failure is what we are to look in for mm. why she is having a renal failure mm. so let's see let's mm. find out we'll get any answer or not mm. go ahead with it <coughs> Uh, so at this point, uh, so basically she is in an intubated state and the <coughs> atropine infusion is ongoing again at six early and see so otherwise she is hemodynamically stable. So considering her history, we started her on valdoxin also. Mm. So it was started at thirty milligram per kilogram was started then in, in bolus was given followed by infusion at eight mg per hour. Okay. And she was admitted to our ICU for further care. So for <coughs> following ICU admission, she was put on continuous hemodynamic monitoring, and actually, uh, throughout the period of ICU care, actually her chest was continuously intermittently monitored and everything, but everything was found to be normal. So we slowly tapered the infusions, and by the uh, second or third day, she started improving, like overall. Okay. Now, uh, uh, what happened to the? Uh, can you just tell me the past medical history and things again, if you can? Uh, uh medical history uh, so right now she is in the icu mm. that is a story she had come for effort from another hospital mm. she is in the icu on atropine infusion mm. ongoing we have initiated also initial on a pralidoxine mm. uh, right now uh, her uh, parameters are okay mm. okay then so basically she is previous history she is a non hypertensive patient and okay. also a non case of severe depression that's all okay. the history we have so she was on uh, this thing uh, two medications for depression and also Uh, hypertension. She was taking olanzapine. Drugs uh, for uh, hyper uh, depression. Uh, depression, olanzapine, and lithium. 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 Mm. So why lithium? Lithium usually they don't start for depression. Usually mm. they will start for bipolar disorders. Mm. So why lithium? And what is the significance of lithium here? Lithium itself causes renal failure and acidosis. Lithium I can cause renal failure acidosis. That is one end. We are not very sure whether she has taken. Along with multiple tablets of lithium, mm. or else she is already on a chronic lithium therapy, and a sudden worsening of this can further worsen the renal failure. So there is already she is on lithium, mm. so she is on a chronic lithium therapy right now. Mm. On top of that, she can suddenly worsen. So mm. that part also we have to be considering. Mm. So when the patient is on lithium with renal failure with acidosis, mm. we have to consider whether we need to go ahead with dialysis or not. Mm-hmm. so the acidosis is persisting and uh, renal failure is worsening then definitely we should be taking for dialysis irrespective of the lithium level mm-hmm. the lithium level is also elevated definitely then we need to go ahead with dialysis mm-hmm. so we have to send for a lithium level also which i think we have uh, sent in for this patient and it was found to be uh, below the therapeutic range mm-hmm. so that is fine so mm. uh, whenever you see this renal failure you have to see what <coughs> the patient is on lithium a subtle small small a maybe small dehydration can for worsen the renal function so mm-hmm. that is very important when the patient is on lithium mm. so that might be the reason there is was a worsening of renal mm. function we don't know mm. we have to attribute to that only mm. there is nothing else we have got mm-hmm. for So she was only on antihypertensive and this two drugs that's it. And her uh, from previous record actually her last creatinine was one point nine, but she was not taking any medication. One point nine. So there is an already in a chronic component. <coughs> on top mm. of that, there is an acute worsening, mm. multiple factors, mm. acute worsening on lithium. Mm. On top of that, he had dehydration, some mm. amount of dehydration, mm. some insult would have added. So mm. all those things attributed to the renal mm. failure and acidosis. Mm. But over admission and post admission, actually her ABG improved actually over time. Mm-hmm. The only thing we were <coughs> given was support, support the therapy, fluid dehydration, nutrition, and everything. <coughs> and also this infusion of pralidoxin with atropine. But actually she clinically improved and also the ABG improved over time. Okay. So we didn't have to go for like any hemodialysis or anything as such. Okay. Mm. Fine. So she was actually weaned after about uh, fourth day. Like fourth day. Uh, mm. She uh, has been weaned. Mm. Okay. So uh, how will you plan for an? Uh, therapy with atropine de escalation therapy with atropine 
how will you decide okay this much is enough you look <coughs> at the secretion and decide but mm. you have to be very clear that after maybe 40 to 8 hours or 72 hours of hospital admission there could be other reason why there is increased secretions mm-hmm. that can be due to a secondary or vap mm-hmm. ventilator associated pneumonia mm-hmm. that you cannot attribute to organophosphorus so mm-hmm. maybe at that point maybe an initial serum astral colonistries and later also we can repeat the serum astral colonistries and see how the levels are so mm-hmm. when you compare the two levels you will get some idea mm-hmm. rather than going with single, single level level. you can compare with what was the initial one Basically. and what was the later one then mm-hmm. we can say whether it was attributed to mm-hmm. the organophosphorus the mm-hmm. secretion or it due to a secondary and you can always look into the other markers like mm-hmm. sepsis markers mm-hmm. you can look into the crp procalcitonin look at the x-ray mm-hmm. how is the type of secretions and all those things we can see the initial type of secretion and here it will be totally different so mm-hmm. that time you have to be very vigilant and uh, if this patient can go in for atropine psychosis, very mm-hmm. important. Mm-hmm. You have to keep that in mind. And if that, so you have to make into glycopyrrolate. Mm-hmm. So glycopyrrolate will not cause the blood CNS brain drain. Yeah. So CNS penetration won't be there. Mm-hmm. So that is the additional advantage. So mm-hmm. in a nutshell, what you have to discuss here is that when you have a suspicion, whether it's a carbamate or an organophosphorus, there is no harm in starting atropine along with pralidoxine. Carbamate, there is no contraindication, but mm-hmm. it's not going to be beneficial. Mm-hmm. Then you send for your toxicological analysis and you are getting back it as organophosphorus. Mm-hmm. You can continue mm-hmm. pralidoxin. Mm-hmm. But if it's carbamate, you can stop, stop pralidoxin. Mm-hmm. That is the one thing. Mm-hmm. But here, always you have to keep in mind regarding a co-ingestion. Any toxicology cases, you cannot be a co-ingestion or can, can be an additional medical issue mm-hmm. or top of a toxicological issue. That also can be an issue. Why mm-hmm. 1.9 creatine? Why she is having a 1.9 creatine and somebody is continuing her on lithium? Mm-hmm. Whether that is correct. So mm-hmm. all those things are uh, we need to uh, look into okay anything else that you need to add on uh, no suppose if the patient was actually in a state where we couldn't get an IV or line or something we couldn't even give IV IM atropine as the initial dose initial right? doses uh, right. in a peripheral s- setup where you cannot mm. have uh, IV you mm. can go ahead with IM mm. 6mg can be given IM as initial dose okay. then we can continue okay, okay. Fine. 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 Thank, thank you thank you